Hey everyone, my name is Kerry Hooper. I'm here to talk about some uh, modern web application vulnerabilities. Uh, first off, thank you to the B-Sides DFW staff. I uh, really appreciate you all. Uh, and also I appreciate you, the viewer. Uh, thanks for coming and thanks for uh, viewing my talk. First, uh, who am I? I said before, Kerry also go by Hoop. Um, i on no Twitter at uh, no pant root dance. I'm a red team analyst. I have some uh, offensive security certifications, also a CISP. And I like fishing, uh, both types, and some golf, and I love building things, regardless of whether it's virtual or physical. So uh, why, why have this talk? Why listen? Why care? Uh, so over the last year, I've done some deep dives into some, uh, some modern web application vulnerabilities, uh, specifically things that I've seen both in the wild and, uh, and in clients. I wanted to have a deeper understanding of all these bugs uh, and also the applications themselves. So I ended up building a platform. I like Python, so I built a, uh, a vulnerable platform in Python in order to implement some of these bugs. Because in order to better understand it, I figured I'd want to build it myself and play around with it. Uh, also, I'd have to come home every night, and my mind was filled with all the OWASP top 10, you know, injection, cross-site scripting, uh, all these new vulnerabilities that I was learning. And I wanted to share with my significant other. She had no idea what I was talking about. So I decided to build these into some sort of demo application to showcase them to her and better explain what I did, how I did my work, and, and what I was excited about when I came home. So in order for this, uh, this dem these demonstrations that I'm going to demonstrate today, I built them into this uh, web server. It's on GitHub at the link below. I'll distribute it in the Discord server as well. This is a, a program written in Python, specifically the Cherry Pie module. Uh, some JavaScript and HTML in there, but mostly, mostly pretty much in Python. There are three PDF modules that were utilized, and we'll get into more of those later. So that's what you'll need at home if you decide to uh, replicate these, these bugs. But also, I've built it into a Docker container. It's also on Docker Hub if you'd like to take a look. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, for the first is AngularJS uh, template injection. Second is unsafe PDF generation. And the third is uh, the, man, the bootstrap man in the middle vulnerability, and also the importance of HSTS, which is HTTP strict transport security headers, and also HTTPS everywhere. So more and more, uh, there are application security trends of, of, of three main things. One, the reliance on client-side frameworks. Hence, we'll talk, we'll talk about XSS and AngularJS. Also, uh, more and more reliance on integrating third-party tools, server, um, Server uh, speeds are getting faster, and also they're getting cheaper and cheaper as, as companies move to the cloud. So the server load isn't as much of a big deal anymore as it was 10 years ago. Therefore, application designers can input these third-party modules without any additional uh, decrease in speed or efficiency of the application. Therefore, we're seeing a lot of this plug-and-play behavior, especially the generation of PDFs, which I've seen more and more as I've investigated this vulnerability. And last, as the network attack surface is shrinking, uh, network security perimeters are being more hardened. Uh, we will see more and more uh, client side or, or uh, attacks as evidenced by the, the data breach investigation report from Verizon. Phishing is becoming a, a greater attack vector, but I believe we'll see more man in the middle attacks, especially with all these misconfigurations. So let's get started. So AngularJS, who's heard of it? I'm gonna give a chance for all of the hands to get raised. All right, I see, I see some hands. I see some virtual hands. There we go. So AngularJS, for those of you that might not know, is a front-end JavaScript library. Uh, what you really need to remember is that it makes things pretty. It makes things beautiful in, in the browser. It runs, runs client-side, it runs in the browser. It's also open source and was created by Google in, in 2010. It is different, though, from technologies such as Angular, uh, Vue, React, though they, they do very similar things. They're, they're all generally MVC frameworks, model view controller frameworks, and they run in the front end, they run in the browser. Now, it's very confusing. Angular JS is not to be confused with Angular. And when I talk about these vulnerabilities, all these vulnerabilities are specifically in Angular JS. So when I say Angular JS, it's everything below version 2.0. Angular, it's everything above 2.0. And there's a big difference between the two. It's not easy to upgrade at all. There's actually a complete revamp of the framework and that, that actually contributes to why this vulnerability is still present in a lot of web apps today. If you think about, some of you might have been on Teams, uh, developer teams, upgrading from jQuery or upgrading from like PHP 5 to PHP 7. 
it's, uh, it's, it's a big deal. It might be difficult to upgrade. It might be, more importantly, costly for application teams to, to upgrade. And everything breaks if you try to use that, that new framework. You really have to rewrite things from, from the ground up. So, as a result, uh, development teams will use this older framework, even though it has some of these, some of these weaknesses. Um, once I started looking for AngularJS, once I, started, once I knew what it was, uh, I would find about 50% of the time they'd be using the newer version of Angular and 50% of the time the older version of Angular. All right, let's discuss templating as well. So Angular uses this concept called templating. Uh, and we can use this as an example of uh, seeing, seeing what Angular might look like. Say you right click in the browser view source, what exactly are you looking for? Well, one, um, AngularJS will have, will have ng directives and they'll look, they'll look like those attributes. If you look at the body attribute, ng-app, ng-controller, these, these are all attributes which queue in at the AngularJS library to pay attention to those. You also see some script imports. Uh, in this case, it's importing the, the AngularJS uh, script, as well as references to app.controller or, or scopes. All of these are Angular-like things, and, and you may also see these in the other front-end frameworks too. But that's how you know you're, you're dealing with this MVC framework. You also see these templates, which are delimited by those curly Q brackets surrounding message in this case. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how templating works. So template injection. So these templates are, are present within the page, and the JavaScript library replaces those on the fly with that JavaScript uh, logic. Some of you may have heard of server-side template injection. Maybe, maybe not. I uh, encourage you, if you haven't, look it up. Uh, look up on payload all the things. Let's Google it. There's a ton of good write-ups on that. But essentially, in server-side template injection, user input is handled unsafely by the server-side templating engine. Some examples of this would be Twig, Jinja2, uh, or Velocity. However, in client-side template injection, it's the exact same thing, untrusted input is being handled by that client-side library, by JavaScript, but it's also being executed by the, the templating engine. So the result for server-side template injection may be as bad as uh, what? I'll give you a chance to, to think in, in your heads. What, what might it result in? Some of you might know. RCE, remote code execution. You can execute code on the server. But in contrast to that, client-side template injection, remember, it's JavaScript only. If you can execute JavaScript, the result is going to be cross-site scripting. So through this injection technique, we're able to inject uh, JavaScript into the client browser, into the victim's browser, a lot like reflected or stored cross-site scripting. So putting it all together, AngularJS template injection deals with templates. There are certain expressions that are delimited with these double curly Q brackets, and these are replaced at runtime. The JavaScript library is accessed, and that uh, that object uh, and, and the attribute of the object are replaced at runtime. Now, this attack was uh, introduced by Mario Heydrich in 2016, uh, also, also works for Cure53. So six years after this front-end framework was actually created, uh, Mario came up with, with this injection technique. And the reason why this works is because he was able to access uh, objects within JavaScript and draw off their, their primitives in order to uh, construct uh, payloads that would, that would result in client-side code execution. Now, Angular actually, the AngularJS team introduced a sandbox to, to help prevent some of these attacks. After Mario gave his talk in 2016, 2017, uh, September 2017, they came up with a, a sandbox, which attempted to limit the scope uh, in which these JavaScript objects could uh, could operate. So since 1.1.5, this sandbox was running. Um, and, and for those of you that might not know what a sandbox is, it, it essentially limits um, the scope that these Angular objects had access to. So it couldn't access any of the critical objects, such as the document or the window. Since, uh, since the sandbox was created, there were multiple, multiple, multiple sandbox bypasses um, I've, got, I've got this link. I'd encourage you to take a look at this article. Great article, great link, containing all of the known, uh, at least all the ones that I know of, the sandbox bypass of the AngularJS. Now, I don't pretend to know exactly what all of this JavaScript means. So, Jan Horn created one in, 
that bypassed the sandbox in 1.2, Gareth Hayes in 1.3, and Ian Hickey in 1.5. And all of these were just ways of breaking out of that sandbox context in order to access that primitive JavaScript uh, objects in order to execute code. I would highly recommend uh, Gareth Hayes' B-Sides Manchester 2017 talk. Uh, awesome, awesome explanation if you guys are interested in more research. And finally, uh, version 1.6 bypass came out. Mario Heydrich, uh, the original creator, came up with this, this primitive bypass, constructor.constructor, .constructor, which was the, the, the nail in the coffin for AngularJS. And actually, after this, the AngularJS team didn't even create, the, they didn't um, implement the sandbox anymore. They threw it away and uh, basically threw it in the garbage. So that why were they able to bypass this in so many different ways? Um, that's mainly because JavaScript is weird. JavaScript is so weird. Anybody who has programmed uh, in, in JavaScript knows this. So uh, Brian Heisel uh, presented, presented the, this topic in uh, Besides Augusta 2018, and he, he talked a little bit about quoteless strings and JavaScript types. And in, in the top box there, it's the, the exclamation point with two square brackets. Now, JavaScript interprets that as the Boolean value false. It also interprets just regular square brackets as an empty array or possibly an empty string. And he showed that by concatenating them together, by adding those together in JavaScript, it actually equals the string false. Yeah, J JavaScript's weird. So with the string false, you can then access this, the string primitives or the string um, functions. You, you can uh, call the from char code method and come up with many, many different ways of executing arbitrary JavaScript code. Someday I hope to understand exactly why all of these are the way they are. If you know, let me know. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit. Uh, just understand, JavaScript is really weird, and many times there are dozens of way to, ways to accomplish the same thing. So that's why there were, there were many JavaScript bypasses. Uh, the sandbox was eventually abandoned, and the AngularJS team said that it wasn't actually meant for 100% security. And so, What's the remediation? We'll talk about that after the demo. So this is my AngularJS app. Uh, it's a hello world type app that basically takes in one parameter from the URL, a get parameter, and it places it within the, uh, within the DOM. Pay attention to those three uh, red boxes. This, these, are, these are hallmarks of an Angular app. You've got the ng directives, you've got the Angular import, you've also got references to controllers uh, and scope. You can also detect this with a really cool tool I want to introduce called Wappalizer. It's been around forever. Some of you who are pen testers might know about it. But it's a, uh, it's a browser plugin that plugs into both Firefox and Chrome, and it can detect exact versions of certain things running on websites. And it's great if you're doing bug boundaries as well. Anyway, so this, this application takes in untrusted user input and puts it directly in the, into the page. Some of you <laughs> might see this and automatically think, hey, that's some reflected cross-site scripting right there. Well, let's, let's test it out. All right, I'm going to mirror the screen. And let's check out the demo. So I've got the demo here. This is, a, uh, this is the app running on localhost. As I refresh the screen, you might be able to see um, those templates reflecting within the page. For that split second, the JavaScript hasn't executed, and, and the template is, is visible to the eye. Obviously, we've got some reflection going on. This burp sweep would call this uh, reflect, input reflected within the HTML. We can change the, the, the name in order to, uh, to change the name that's presented in the page. But what evil things can we do with this? Well, some people might try uh, putting in a, a script tag in order to try to execute HTML. But as we see, the, the script tag didn't execute. It was just reflected into the page. Well, looking at the source, we might, we'll see that in that the, uh, the application is putting some input sanitization in place. It's actually sanitizing those angle brackets and replacing it with the HTML encoded um, ampersand greater than semicolon. So how do we get around this? We can get around this with AngularJS XSS. So by crafting this AngularJS payload, which bypasses the sandbox for 1.6.9, we can execute an alert within the application. Whereas we wouldn't have been able to before with, uh, with standard payloads. All right, moving back to the presentation, extend. Are we good? Cool. 
All right, so what happened? Uh, we, we weren't able to use those standard payloads. Uh, this, this was meant to mimic some PHP type functions like HTML special chars or HTML entities, which would normally sanitize effectively that user supplied input. But using this front end technology, we were able to bypass those traditional cross site scripting uh, re uh, remediations and uh, actually execute script within the context of the user. So we talked about remediation. User input is always evil. This is a this is a hallmark of application security. Um, you know, I think six out of the ten of the OWASP top ten deals with this untrusted user input. And when I talk about user input, I'm talking about everything from parameters, not just parameters, but cookies, user agents, headers, everything. Everything should be uh, untrusted until it's properly sanitized and vetted. The more that I saw this front end framework, the more that I tested for client side template injection. Uh, and Angular JS XSS, and I started seeing it everywhere. I, maybe it was the attribution bias, maybe not, but I started seeing this in app after app after app, and even um, even one of the technology giants, uh, flagship apps, I saw this, and I found client side template injection. Uh, normal sanitization uh, doesn't always work to remediate these, and that's why front end frameworks have to be kept in mind. The user experience is is always king, and it's uh, it's going to contribute to these front-end frameworks being used more and more in the past. So user input is always evil. That's one of the themes of the stock. Next, I'd like to uh, talk about the next class of vulnerability, um, unsafe PDF generation. This wasn't intuitive for me at first, but again, much like the AngularJS uh, or client-side template injection, once I saw this and understood the vulnerability, I saw it more and more in applications all over, both in my organization and on the internet. So as, as server resources are not as much of a priority, uh, web, app web, app, web application uh, complexity has been increasing and increasing and increasing. Developers got a sticky note on, on the to-do board. Uh, it's so much easier just to plug and play a third-party library and, and get that functionality within your app rather than build it from scratch. So, so we're, I believe we're going to see a more, a more of a reliance on this, especially for something as complex as PDF generation, which may require the parsing of websites and HTML. However, uh, the inclusion of these third-party libraries may uh, also include those security bugs or, um, or short-sightedness on, on the, um, from the developers and the security teams. Maybe, maybe they didn't uh, think about the whole picture before including these in. So in order to talk about this, I first need to discuss server-side request forgery. I know many of you may be familiar with this already, but I'd like to, I'd like to discuss, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same level. So typically in a server-side request forgery, um, the client or the browser is able to send a certain request to the server and cause that server to make some sort of other request. Usually this is an HTTP request. So if I can contact the uh, web server in the cloud and cause it to make an HTTP request, that would be a, a, an example of server-side request forgery. And so what can you do with this? You can, you can bypass firewalls, you can scan ports. It also allow, you can also access local host data, sometimes secrets, sometimes AWS metadata. Um, this was uh, showcased in the, the Capital One breach a, a couple of years ago. Capital One's cloud platform was able to be uh, completely taken over. At least their cloud account was taken over by a server-side request forgery in the cloud. So SSRF can be incredibly powerful. Um, it's, it'll, it, it'll, I believe it'll fall in with the OS top 10, specifically A1 injection. And uh, Orange Psy really took this to the extreme to demonstrate how big of a deal uh, SSRF can be in the form of protocol smuggling. I encourage you to, to take a look at his blog after the presentation. This is one of the uh, screenshots from his blog. He's able to chain together four different weaknesses in order to uh, result in code execution on the remote server. Now, I, I don't expect you to understand all of this, but just I'll give you the high notes here. The first bug in red is a harmless SSRF. It's, it's constrained. That is the, uh, the, the URL um, encoded, um, the, the, UR, the, the URL encoded resource was just kept as such and wasn't treated as, as bits and bytes. It wasn't URL decoded, however, he was able to chain this with a second SSRF bug in light blue, and there, um, that was an unconstrained bug. Using that unconstrained SSRF, he was able to manipulate that with the use of URL encoding, 
and that UR, the URL encoded bytes were decoded by the server, and then he was able to uh, smuggle that additional protocol in, um, and eventually resulting in unsafe serialization, uh, unsafe deserialization in a Ruby gem. Highly encourage that blog post, one of the best I've seen. Well, two, two security researchers, uh, both at the time, uh, I'm not sure if they still do, or both at the time worked for, for HackerOne. Um, they, they presented on this topic in DEF CON 27, owning the clout through uh, SSRF with PDF generators. This was Ben Sadagapur, uh, a.k.a. Namsek, and Sarah Brocious, a.k.a. Dakin. And they did a really good job. I'd encourage you to, to take a look at that talk. It's on YouTube as well. They, uh, they discussed, um, they discussed a, a story about how they were able to, um, they were able to hack a ride-sharing app. They found that the ride-sharing app put in uh, or gave them invoices in the form of PDFs, and their user input was able to be, was, was taken, trusted, and put into that PDF, and they were able to manipulate the HTML that was being rendered. Well, they figured out if they were able to manipulate the HTML, they were able to possibly inject script tags or break out of style tags, and eventually they found the SSRF. They read the manual extensively on the actual PDF generator that they were able to find, which, uh, which I believe was, um, was, was Wheezy Print, the one that they exploited. And they, they, found a, they found these bugs. They were able to own the entire cloud environment by accessing the metadata. Strongly encourage watching their talk. So there's uh, many PDF generators online. Just Google free PDF generation online. There's a good chance that they're going to be generated on the server side. And uh, I would guess that many of them are vulnerable. PDFs are everywhere. Users love PDFs. App, application teams love PDFs. Uh, I guess our society is just in love with PDFs. I see them everywhere. So uh, how, how does it work generally? Well, in order for a PDF to be created, uh, either there's either going to be an image that's going to be put into the PDF format or it's going to render that HTML. And there's two ways to do this, one with HTML renderer and one with a headless browser. I'll get into both uh, on the next slide or two. Just a quick Google search for free PDF generator. What do we get? Two, 242 million. Uh, that's, that's a lot of results. So the difference between a headless browser and an HTML renderer. Headless browser is generally like a browser without a GUI. Some of you might have heard of Puppeteer, Headless Chrome. Um, those are the ones that come to mind. And it typically executes all the JavaScript to, to correctly render the page. Now, on the other hand, an HTML renderer uh, it, it parses the HTML without, without the logic of a, a browser engine. And typically, I say typically because sometimes they do, it typically doesn't execute JavaScript. However, for both of them, when they're rendering PDFs, untrusted HTML is bad. And at a minimum, uh, if, parsed, if parsed untrusted HTML, uh, it can result in SSRF. And also XSS, cross-site scripting, which is execution of JavaScript in an app, may result in JavaScript execution on the server side, which has some strong implications uh, that technically would be remote code execution. So I've got three examples I want to walk through, and I've got three examples that I'd like to demo. Uh, the first is uh, using an open source library called WKHTML to PDF. Uh, this, this is the app that will be used on the background. It uses a rendering engine called uh, QT WebKit. And um, we can use an image tag. If we inject an image tag, we can invoke an HTTP GET. After all, it has to reach out and um, it has to reach out and grab that image in order to include it in the PDF. So if we have it reach out to a server under our control, we can reveal the user agent. In this, uh, I, I developed a quick and dirty Python script, uh, echo user agent.py. It's on GitHub if you want to if you want to steal it or make it better. However, um, I'm going to use that in this demo in order to, to show that we can reveal the backend server-side PDF generation technology with that user agent and causing an SSR off to a server we control. Here's, here's an example of this. And specifically, this shows the uh, WKHTML, the PDF within the user agent. And sometimes even it gives a version. We're going to do both these. Uh, so what else, what else can we do? Uh, let's, let's, show in, let's show in a demo how, how bad this can be. I'm going to take it off um, presentation mode. Let's go. One sec, please. Let's duplicate and let's let's check out this pwnage via PDF generation. So this is the app. Create a PDF, right? Generate a PDF. 
We, in this case, we show the, the front end technology, WKHTML to PDF. However, most applications won't actually do this. So let's catch the user agent in order to figure out uh, what we're dealing with here. First, um, you might test the functionality, see what happens. In this case, as, in, uh, as is the case that I've seen a lot, the PDF will be stored on the server. If the PDF's not stored on the server, I've also seen it stored in the cloud in, in some sort of storage bucket, be it AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform. So let's, uh, let's test this with a, a primitive payload to invoke that server-side request forgery. Name it test two. All right, we've got a H1 tag. In HTML, that's, that's a header, right? It should be, should be big and bold. And then we've got the image tag down below. And the image tag is a reference, contains a reference, href, to, a, uh, to an image online. In this case, it's a cat. Well, once we generate the PDF, look at the, look at the PDF, we should see a picture of the cat. That tells us that the server went out and grabbed that image of the cat and put it into that, into that PDF. So we've just caused a server-side request forgery, and that's the most primitive, is, is just catching an image or, or getting an image in an image tag. But we can use that by requesting an image in a server under our control, and we can see the uh, user agent. So here we go, we're going to localhost, which I've got a listener on, on port 80. Capture user agent. As soon as we generate that PDF, we should see, we, sh we should see the user agent. And this will be a whole HTTP request. All the script is is just parsing that request and putting the user agent to the terminal. And here we go. There's the user agent. There's WK HTML to PDF. All right, but how can we take this further? Uh, what, what are we worried about? What is our nightmare scenario with the server-side request forgery? Now, this is just an HTML renderer. So what we can do uh, potentially is access secrets on the server itself that may not be accessible to uh, anybody externally. It may not be accessible uh, to anybody except for localhost. And this is a way to, to expel secrets from localhost, but also from the intranet, uh, because there's a good chance that this server is in a DMZ and it has special access to internal resources. So we can do that with an iframe. We can put the source of the iframe equal to uh, a privileged resource. Just for this demo, we, we had a slash secret and then we submit that, the PDF generator is gonna reach out, grab that secret, and then render it within an iframe. Let's see how that looks. Yep, outside frame, and we've got the secret right inside. So this is one example of uh, ponage we can, we can reap with just WKHTML uh, to PDF, which is uh, HTML renderer. All right, let's move on. Changing the screen again. All right, all right, what's the next baby we can kick? Oh, this one was kicked before at DEF CON 27. Uh, this was Wheezy Print. This is called a, a visual rendering engine, and uh, Wheezy Print's a, uh, is called on the website a smart solution, helping web developers to create PDF documents easily. It's really easy to install, it's a pip install. However, it does have quite a few dependencies. Most of those dependencies are already satisfied on Linux. However, with Windows, it's a bit involved to, to get those libraries on, on board. Uh, please reach out if you, if you wanna to try to replicate this, I can help you through. So in this, um, in, the, in the exact same way as before, what we wanna do is try to, try to um, extract the user agent. We wanna figure out what's the backend technology. So in the same way, we, we should catch the user agent uh, just as easily as using um, echo user agent we could send we, we could catch a response say in the burp collaborator uh, if you're if you're a burp suite pro user or or any other of those third party services and you'll be able to see the uh, all the headers for example not just the user agent. So here we see the user agent is Wheezy Print. Luckily, the developers give us the actual version as well. That's real nice. Let's uh, let's see how how this could look. Now there's there's a little bit more to this demo, and and I want to surprise you all because this is not intuitive at all. And th this was the coolest part of uh, the DEF CON 27 presentation on the cloud, in my opinion. So in the same manner as before, uh, we we see user print. Let's catch the user agent. We already know how how that it creates a, a PDF. We've got that running already. And let's take a, a basic user agent payload, create a PDF. 
All right. At this point, the browser is, is going out and it is, uh, or excuse me, the, the back end Wheezy print is going out and grabbing that. It thinks it's an image. And uh, we capture the user agent, Wheezy print 47. Now, one of the cool things about Wheezy print is that it, uh, it gives the developers the ability to include local files. This is not intuitive at all. Uh, so given a crafted payload, um, we're able to include a local file as well. I want to show you here that the, the iframe payload doesn't actually work with, with this particular um, headless browser. The iframe just shows up like, like garbage. Well, let's try to include a local file. In order to do that, um, we're going to use an A, A tag in HTML, also called an anchor tag. And I've got the payload right here. Let me paste it in. So uh, during the DEF CON 27 uh, research, uh, Ben Sadakapur and Sarah Brocious found that by reading the documentation that this was actually possible, that they were able to include these local files. Using the href, uh, which is a reference to a local file on the C drive, when the PDF was generated, it, was, it actually showed up as, as a link. However, the file was embedded inside the PDF. Let's see that in action. I'm going to use a, uh, a script. I'm going to save this, this PDF locally. And I'm going to use a script that goes through and parses the PDF object, extracts all of those encoded uh, objects within, and then decodes them. And, and hopefully we'll be able to see the file that was embedded inside the PDF. So first, I'm going to save it locally. And then after that, We'll, uh, we'll, we'll decode it. And there's no encryption going on here. This is just a flate, a flate, dec a flate encoded file. And here we see the, uh, the password file that happened to be on this, in this temp directory. Really cool, right? Now, uh, I mean, th th in a terminal is cool and all. Um, let's, let's move the terminal out of the way. And we can see, if I click it on the uh, actual link in the PDF document, you, uh, you'll be able to see that we can download the file directly from the PDF with that, uh, with that file href. There it is. Really cool. All right. Moving back to presentation mode. All right. We just saw this. Um, in this case, we got win.ini. Um, great. Now, example number three. This is where it gets super cool. Uh, I don't have a demo for this one, but I'd, I'd like to show you in, uh, in these screenshots. So Chrome, Headless Chrome, who's heard of it? Uh, probably half of you. Actually, everyone in this room. Great. Oh, wow, we got some. All right. <laughs> we, got, we got some techies in this room. All right, so th this is basically just Chrome.exe with the dash dash headless flag. This was shipped by default in Chrome 59 and 60. So there's a good chance if you're using Chrome right now, you can use it with the headless option. And I've actually seen this more and more in web applications, specifically Chrome, uh, because it's so easy. It's plug and play. So you, you can invoke it with this command, Chrome, tac tac headless, tac tac disable GPU. Uh, they recommend disabling the GPU on Windows. I don't know why. And then the print to PDF option goes out and it sends Chrome to a website or a local HTML document, and then it creates a uh, PDF out of it. And this is a full featured headless browser. So this is how it might look um, in the, uh, when we catch the user agent, it will actually say headless Chrome. It doesn't use the traditional Chrome user agent, which I think is pretty cool. And it, it renders the PDF uh, like that as a non-existent image. So this is a full feature browser. This can do everything a regular browser can do. So what can we do with it? Can we do job, JavaScript execution? So when, uh, when submitting this JavaScript to, uh, to the PDF generator, Chrome is going to go take that HTML, try to parse it, see that there's a script tag, try to execute that JavaScript, and as a result, document.write is executed within the PDF. You can do a lot more than with, with this, and I, I'm, I, I, don't have, I probably don't have to explain to most of the audience members. Uh, we now have code execution on the server in the form of JavaScript. So you can do things such as uh, utilize the request API. For example, in this, in, in, using the, uh, the fetch 
API, the request interface of the Fetch API, we can create web requests. So this can request an internal document, fetch it, and then with that, do something with the response. For example, um, you could take you could then take that response, send that out to an exfiltration server. You could send that to a Burp collaborator instance. You could send that anywhere you want. And not only that, you could do this programmatically and try to access all of those internal endpoints. Hey, maybe all of the all of the ports on those external and internal endpoints. Um, and you could really wreak havoc, especially especially given unbridled access to uh, execute JavaScript on a server that is in the, in the DMZ. There are some limitations of that. Browsers have internal security mechanisms. One of those is called the same origin policy, or SOP. So an origin in um, HTTP is a, is a tuple of a scheme, a host name or, or domain, and then a port. And those three things all make up an origin. Now the same origin policy says that JavaScript on host A cannot go out and access a totally different host uh, uh, if they are of a different origin. It can't go out and access information and bring that back in. So that, that's enforced by the browser specifically. So how do we bypass the same origin policy? How do we, how do we bypass that? Well, there's this nifty little tool called cross-origin resource sharing. So cro cores or cross-origin resource sharing is a relaxation of the same origin policy. And it, uh, it allows resources to be, to be shared between different origins. Now, there's many different ways to, uh, to identify a misconfiguration in cores, but uh, a few of them are reflected origin or having a null origin, or just a website has access control allow origin header, which is just metadata uh, with, a, with a star symbol. Uh, I'd highly recommend uh, any of those those of you interested in this to go to the uh, the pen tester the, sorry the web security academy. Uh, there's some excellent course challenges there. So there are often many times ways uh, ways around this, uh, and these can be achieved through this um, JavaScript execution on the server. There's also a thing called DNS rebinding, which can get really nasty, and I'm not going to go into it here um, because that's a whole other talk. And I'd love to give that talk some other time, but uh, maybe. Maybe at a, a Hack Fort Worth or a, or a DC 214. So DNS rebinding essentially tricks the browser into violating the same origin policy, and it does this with a malicious DNS server and JavaScript execution. This allows access to private networks by tunneling traffic through the uh, the victim browser, which is essentially a zombie browser, and it's it's a really cool attack. Not only that, there's been a number of tools that have been released lately specifically uh, NCC group singularity that makes this extremely easy, whereas before it took minutes, now it's taking seconds. So remediation for this untrusted PDF generation. Uh, so I would recommend creating these PDFs within a client, within a client-side library. If you're not parsing the HTML on the server, these vulnerabilities can't, can't occur. Also, don't trust user input. That's, again, one of the themes of this presentation. Do not trust user input sanitize and, and prevent this from, from getting ingested directly by the HTML renderer. Next, uh, and finally, I'd like to talk about the bootstrap man in the middle vulnerability and the importance of HTTPS. Let's start with a, a quick primer on like what a man in the middle looks like. Think to yourself, close your eyes, go to your happy place, and maybe think of a, think of a man in the middle. What does it look like? All right, well, we've got one here on the screen. This is an example of an ARP spoofing attack. Uh, if you're on the same LAN as a victim, you can impersonate the router. Another one might look like a Wi-Fi pineapple, like a Hack5 Wi-Fi pineapple. Another one might be your ISP, your internet service provider, passively uh, collecting traffic or, or uh, collecting what you're looking at online. The next is a, uh, an HTTPS decryption utility, uh, which uh, many, many, enterprises use for security purposes that, pa that decrypts that TLS traffic and then re-encrypts it for inspection. And then perhaps maybe a legal man in the middle, maybe an FBI court order or uh, Freedom of Information Act. No, Patriot Act. That's it. There's a really cool example of uh, a man in the middle vulnerability uh, released in 2005, years and years ago now. Uh, Matty Aroni, the, uh, I think he's still president of Offensive Security, came up with his blog post. Uh, the tiny URL is, is in, this, uh, in this slide. I'm not going to get into this attack because I don't think we have time. 
um, but I'd highly encourage you to, uh, to go out and seek it. It involves spoofed UDP packets, uh, resetting the Cisco IOS router configuration, uh, enabling TFTP, and then uh, reconfiguring it to make it a GRE tunnel with, with you in the middle. In 2009, Moxie Marlinspike at, at Moxie uh, released a tool called SSL Strip at Black Hat 2009. Really cool tool. Um, so this, this allowed, uh, this made man in the middle attacks so much easier for HTTPS traffic. Has anyone heard of this? Maybe? Yeah. This is a nasty tool. So this is essentially Moxie trying to defeat session encryption or that, that HTTPS encryption. Well, he found that uh, he was able to insert himself between a victim and, and the server by matching and replacing, uh, by taking advantage of that first HTTP request that came in, which is in complete plain text. Taking off the HTTP, put it on the HTTPS, and then forwarding that to the server. They would, he, would then, uh, he would then forward that response from the server and give that back to the victim. And, and this was a really smart tool, um, and it made man in the middle so much easier. So let's talk about HTTP real quick, uh, HTTP headers. When you send, a when you send a, an HTTP request to Twitter, what does it look like? You have some sort of verb, a get, post, delete, something in, in the first line. And remember, this is all part of the HTTP protocol. You have some sort of resource that you're looking for, and then the, the protocol inversion. In response, you might receive a, a, an HTTP response code, and, and in this case, 301 means moved permanently. And then a bunch of data back in the form of headers. And all, all you need to remember is that headers are just essentially metadata. In this case, the location is extremely important because when paired with the 301, it, it tells the browser to redirect to another resource. In this case, HTTPS, the secure resource. So the browser makes this next request to, to Twitter.com. A whole bunch of other uh, headers are returned. But one specific one that uh, I'd like to talk about is the strict transport security header. So strict transport security, max age, um, and let's, let's dissect this a little bit. So HTTP strict transport security, also called HSTS. If you want to read the manual, it's RFC 6797. And it allows sites to declare themselves accessible only via secure connections. So breaking this out, we have the, the header and then um, the directive, which is the number of seconds to abide by HTTPS. In this case, it's two years. Includes subdomains directive. That means this applies to all the subdomains as well. And then um, the preload directive, which states that this value should be preloaded into the browser. So once this header is returned to the client, the client will no longer use unencrypted methods. It will only use encrypted HTTPS. And that's how powerful this is because it, it effectively prevents uh, man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, barring some sort of certificate um, or, or encryption vulnerability that could just shatter the entire ecosystem. So, for example, let's talk about homedepot.com as a case study. User visits homedepot.com and an HTTP request is sent. If you type that into your address bar, press enter. If you've never visited that site before, a HTTP unencrypted is going to be sent. Home Depot is going to go back, redirect you. The browser is going to go uh, grab the HTTPS, the secure version of the site, and then you're going to receive the response back. That's, how, that's generally how the flow goes. However, uh, next time you visit homedepot.com, the exact same thing is going to happen. That first request is always going to be unencrypted. Next, let's take a look at CDC. CDC does it a lot better. On the first request to CDC, user types in cdc.gov. They want to figure out what, their, uh, what, what the latest guidance is on COVID. An HTTP unencrypted is sent. They respond, hey, 302, you need to go check out the, uh, the browser needs to check out the secure version of the site. The secure version of the site is retrieved. And then CDC sends that back in an encrypted channel, uh, all of the content, but with that extra HSTS header. And that extra HSTS header instructs the browser, and the browser saves this. Hey, never, never again go out and, and reach out for HTTP. Don't go unencrypted. Always trust me in an encrypted manner. So when the user returns to the site the next day, because he forgot the guidance already, that browser will refuse to send that, that unencrypted request. And instead, it will only send that encrypted request, thus protecting the user, especially if the user is on an, an untrusted network, such as uh, a, a local LAN 
coffee shop Wi-Fi, etc. There are many examples of HSTS misconfigurations. I'm not going to get into all of them, but they're widely misimplemented on the internet. One example is Microsoft Live.com. For example, if you visit Live.com, it redirects you to HTTPS Outlook.Live.com slash OWA, and it issues the HSTS header. So why is this an issue? Well, strict transport security, or the HSTS header, is counted per domain, and the subdomain is not the same as, as that domain. So when that HSTS header is, respond, is, is responded, it only applies to Outlook.Live.com. So the client's going to make an unencrypted request every single time they put Live.com into that browser bar. So Live.com is put in the browser bar, an unencrypted request is, is made. They're redirected to Outlook.Live.com. They go out, get the encrypted version, and, and they're sent back um, an HSTS header. However, the next time the user visits Live.com, this HSTS does not do its job because that HSTS header is never applied to Live.com, and only unencrypted requests will be made because of this misconfiguration. This might happen when a user gets a new browser. It might happen when a user is using private mode in some browsers, or it might happen when uh, uh, the user has it's our first time visiting a site. But this is documented in the RFC, actually. It's called the Bootstrap Man in the Middle vulnerability. Uh, it's been around for at least 10 years. This has been published for 10 years, and it's a known issue. There's only one way that I, I know of, of preventing this. We'll get into that in a bit. So potentially, right today, an attacker could, could man in the middle a, a live.com visit on an untrusted network using SSL strip. Still, 20 years, or excuse me, 11 years after, Moxie released that tool. So the solution to this is HSTS preload. Preload is a mechanism in which these HSTS sites can ship with the browser. The browser is downloaded and it's automatically stored. It's in the code. It's in the repository. As long as the uh, site meets certain specifications, includes subdomains, has safe redirects, uh, and the max age is sufficiently high. If this site is preloaded. If a domain is preloaded, no HTTP sites will load. Um, no unencrypted sites will load at all, uh, even for internal sites. So watch out if you want to do this on your corporate network. However, I would highly recommend HTTPS everywhere. All right, let's hop on over to the demos. Duplicate the screens. You can check yourself. Um, I'd actually love to, to show this one. You can check yourself within a browser, and I'm going to show you the developer tools. This is exactly uh, as, as we saw before. Go to cdc.gov, and that first request is going to be unencrypted. If we look at the network tab, go to cdc.gov. We click on the request to, to see more, more about it. Um, click on that first one, and, and you can see with the, the lock with the slash through it right there. That's an unencrypted transmission. Now, CDC correctly um, redirects the, the user to, or redirects the user agent or the browser to that HTTPS site, correctly issues that um, HSTS header, and then the very next request will be encrypted. Let's show um, the HSTS preload. HSTS preload can be, uh, can be viewed on uh, hstspreload.org. It's a Chromium project, and uh, the Chromium team, thankfully, assembles all of these domains into, uh, into a repository, and they actually ship with, with the main browsers, the main browsers being uh, Edge, Firefox, and Chrome. I'm sorry I mentioned Edge as, as part of those big three. I had to. Anyway, we can check this at htspreload.org. It's got the submission requirements, but more importantly, you can check if your organization's domains are safe or not. For example, if we type in cdc.gov, it states, no, they're not preloaded, and this is why. It's doing everything right, but it's just not issuing the preload directive. If we put in live.com, there's a number of issues with that. The redirect, the one, there's no HSTS header supplied for the HTTPS version, and the HTTP doesn't redirect correctly. So this is a good way to, to check and, and audit your website to see if it's completely safe. I've put in my website, hooperlabs.xyz, into the preload list. So it actually shipped with every browser, and I think that's pretty cool. So when we actually go in the browser to my website, 
the first request, even though the cache is cleared, even though, even though the history is cleared, first request is always secure. And I, I think that's pretty cool. All right, let's move back to the presentation. All right, remediation. Um, so what can we do to prevent this type of attack? We can implement HSTS preload, uh, but preload means security everywhere, inside your organization and out. And this mitigates many man in the middle threats. Uh, it protects your users, not just the server, but it protects your users. And it requires one single header to be sent, but it can do as much as protect every single user on an untrusted connection. This concludes my presentation. Uh, these have been three classes of modern web application vulnerabilities. Uh, thank you, besides DFW. Thank you for watching. And uh, I look forward to your feedback, and I look forward to answering your questions in the Discord server. Once again, I'm Kerry Hooper. Thank you.